morning, everyone. My name is Kareem Salama, and I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to interview and learn more about NFTs and Web3. I'm joined today by Steve Kaczynski and Scott Duke Commoners. Um, Steve and Scott are here to talk with us about their book, The Everything Token, How NFTs and Web3 Will Transform the Way We Buy, Sell, and Create. Steve Kaczynski is a communications and marketing professional with 15 plus years of experience, including stints in leadership at Progressive Insurance and Nestle. And Scott Duke Commoners is in the Seraphim Rock Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School and a research partner at A16 Crypto. He co-leads uh, Harvard's Crypto, FinTech and Web3 Lab. Um, so welcome to you both. Thank you for the time. Um, if we could course Thanks so much thanks for having us um if we could jump right into it uh, my first question to both of you is uh what drew each of you to research about nfts and web3 i mean i i can start and my my background is um it's funny i always tell people it actually started in the mid 90s which makes absolutely no sense until you have the context of that is sort of my background i've always been interested in tech and when i was in middle school in sort of 95 96 i was coding websites um, and actually creating HTML websites, obviously before the days of Google, who we're talking to right here. And so those resources weren't quite as available. Um, but I always found it was fascinating that I could code something and someone in Paris, France would uh, see the same thing by putting in the address. And, um, you know, of course, that was super interesting. And uh, similarly, I was early to Facebook in 2004 and, and X and now at the time Twitter uh, in 2009. Crypto in, in the sort of 2017, 2018 timeframe. So for me, I've always been super interested in tech. And I remember when I discovered NFTs, um, it, it was sort of this, this click moment for me because obviously we'll get deeper into the subject of the book and what that is. But um, effectively, I was in 2018 telling my poor team at Progressive, anybody who would listen to me, that I thought the Ethereum blockchain was brilliant for creating these smart contracts where you could build businesses. Now, the applications hadn't been built out yet. So uh, in 2020, 2021 timeframe, when I learned that people were starting to do this, I dug in and wanted to learn everything I can. And of course, then uh, ended up meeting Scott. And within about nine months, we co-authored the first Harvard Business Review article about NFTs together. So for me, it's just a passion of tech, a passion of new markets, a passion of human behavior, and kind of putting all those things in one was something that got me really inspired. And you know, first of all, a lot of similarities and, and correlates. I, I too was like coding websites. And I remember when that Google thing appeared, it was like, oh, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, you know, sort of, uh, and, and, and I gotta say, and it was even cooler when I learned about the page rank algorithm, right? I've been someone who's been studying marketplace design and, you know, sort of the intersections of computer science and economics and mathematics to like make markets work better um, now since, since college. Um, and at HBS, I built our course curriculum call, on marketplaces called Making Markets. And in the context of all of that work, you know, sort of as a scholar of market design, I've of course been very aware of crypto in many different contexts. Like, but what I had really, like I hadn't grokked, right? You sort of like, you, lots of people talk about cryptocurrency. Currencies are actually very hard to make use of as mediums of exchange for a long time because you sort of a currency can't be used for for lots of different purposes until many different people are willing to accept it in exchange for goods and services. It actually takes a long time to get started. NFTs, by contrast, and and I wrote an article um, that pointed this out with uh, with Christian Catalini and Ravi Jagadisan um, in early 2021. NFTs, by contrast, sort of start from a small, close-knit community of enthusiasts and spin outwards, right? They can gain value immediately because, you know, a small set of people like all agree, like this thing is valuable, this thing has meaning to me. Um, and so I'd written that in theory, but I hadn't like really, but even so, I think I still hadn't really completely understood it until uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, hilariously, I'd written a puzzle. Uh, I, I, I'm a semi-professional puzzle writer on the side. I was writing a puzzle column for Bloomberg Opinion at the time. I wrote a puzzle about NFTs. And a bunch of people from NFT world saw it and like wrote to me and were like, look, you seem like you would get it. Like you should come and like, you know, sort of join one of our NFT communities and like come and experience this space. And I showed up and I discovered that there were so many new types of transactions and, and community formation around this like sort of like new market design primitive that I had never like really sort of like understood before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to be able to teach this in my class in like six months. And I know almost nothing. 
And so as a scholar, this is like, you know, the most fascinating position you can be in, but it's also like a little terrifying because you now have a fuse. Um, you know, you, you've got to understand the thing well enough, not just to be able to write about it, but to be able to teach it to students. And, you know, you're, you, you know, you've got six months. I was really, really lucky to meet Steve and, and he's, you know, been the most incredible thought partner on this whole journey. That's awesome. Thank you so much for telling us a little bit about your backgrounds. Uh, I mean, since you both come from like pretty different uh, places and came into this space, I was wondering, can you share interests about your particular areas of interest of interest within uh, the NFT and Web3 space? Yeah, there's, I mean, here's what, uh, just to even take a higher level at that is, you know, it's funny because we obviously have our, our more niche interests and I'll get into those too, but it's funny because the title of the book actually is because like the funny story about the title of the book, which we actually write about in there is our, our editor and our, our, um, our, our publisher was basically saying, Hey, if we're writing the title to be straightforward about a complex topic, what problem do NFTs solve? And we started saying like, well, you know, it's, it's loyalty rewards and ticketing and brand building and, uh, and, and, you know, all these, and we started listing all these things. We're like credentials and we're like, it's kind of everything in every industry. So there's all these different ones that they can potentially affect. Now, for me, one of the ones that interests me in particular mm -hmm. is the concept of loyalty rewards. I, I happen to work as the community lead with Starbucks on Starbucks Odyssey, which is their uh, next generation loyalty program that they're beta testing in Web3 right now. And the way that they use loyalty rewards to make it sort of a two-way interaction, where previously it's you buy something, you get a reward, you then exchange that reward to get sort of like a product or whatever. But now it's like, they can do all sorts of brand building missions where you learn about the brand, maybe take a virtual tour of a roastery. Uh, and then maybe you buy a certain product and you get a stamp, which has points. And those can correlate to levels of loyalty, which manifest in rewards. Like there's a, you know, special tumbler behind me that you can see with, uh, you know, a pumpkin spice latte tumbler or a tumbler with one of my NFTs on it. Uh, or you can sell those stamps to somebody else who wants to get more points to acquire those rewards. So that two way loyalty may seem small. But it makes a huge difference to the consumer in becoming a super fan because they engage with the brand more. It's not simply purchase and make it as transactional, but instead developing a relationship with the brand. And many brands have the opportunity to use Web3 as a better set of crypto rails to do that and a better set of overall software rails from an NFT perspective. So for me, uh, loyalty rewards and then and then ticketing, which I won't go deep into because I know I gave a really long example there. But but ticketing is the other one that's super interesting to me. Um, but I'll hand it over to Scott to see what what his interests are. It totally fine. I can take ticketing. So for me as a scholar of market design, right? I've I'm always fascinated by technologies that enable new types of transactions or improvements to existing transaction contexts, and like. You know, one of the things that puzzles people a lot about, you know, sort of the, the early NFT market is that a lot of the early applications were, you know, things we might think of as like digital collectibles, uh, whether, whether they're digital trading cards or, you know, sort of like artworks or something of the sort. Um, but they're all these like digital images or media files. And, you know, you, you sort of like wonder, like, why is that? Like, this is super strange. Like, you know, what, what an unusual like application for a market. But in fact... You know, there are lots of digital collectibles that have existed before and similarly like digital files. Think of like your your music, you know, sort of stored in iTunes or, uh, you know, or, or you know, your um, your Kindle books, your, like your ebooks in Amazon or something of the sort. But they've always lived inside of a single platform. And that's meant that you need a plat. You know, the reason for that is you've needed a platform wrapper to try and determine provenance and to make sure, you know, the asset is unique or, or you know, individually scarce. And why is that? Well, think about the, the alternate context in which you're just like a, an artist selling a digital image. If you show someone the image to give them the option to buy it, you're basically giving them a copy of it, right? They can just like save it on their computer and now they've got it. Like, and that's why you have old, you know, watermarks on places like Getty Images. NFTs solve this problem. Um, they provide a digital record of ownership that can be attached to other media, you know, physical, you know, so digital or physical even, you know, and it serves sort of like a digital deed. It's like a way to like manage a transaction and define a unique owner um, over a data record, uh, you know, a piece of media or something of the sort. And we now know that in fact, you know, for example, and it does it without any intermediary, right? Like the, the asset, in, you know, exists without a platform. Like it's as if your, your Pokemon could like exist independent of Pokemon Go. And so that even if the platform shut down, right? If like, you know, 
you know, God forbid, like, you know, sort of like the, whatever music streaming and collection service you're using shuts down, your music collection would just vanish. With NFTs, the music persists even beyond the platform and you can take it to whatever player you want, like you would with a, with a CD or, you know, or, uh, or cassette or something, you know, even more legacy. But once you realize that digital asset primitive, there are lots of other digital asset transactions we engage in, which this can make better. And the tickets is a, is a prime example, right? Because like, if you think about QR, like what is a digital ticket today? It's like a QR code in your email. If you're going to buy a ticket to a sold out show, like you're trying to get like a secondary market Hamilton ticket because you happen to be in New York. Um, and you know you have to trust that someone is selling you the ticket uniquely, right? Because they, they forward you the QR code. What's to stop them from using it or selling it you know, to or selling it to three other people? With an NFT, there's a unique asset, and you can actually use a software process to bind the transfer of the asset and the transfer of the payment into a single software process. So if it completes, you know the payment went to the seller and the ticket went to you, and once you control the ticket, the seller can't anymore and can't give it to anyone else. And so you can do that secure exchange without any sort of intermediary platform. And again, the asset itself exists independent of a platform. And this is just fascinating to me, right? Like there's so many digital markets where a better ownership primitive is a really powerful tool. That's all great. And it was actually getting to one of my next questions as I think about it. So you've mentioned several use cases for um, NFTs. You mentioned um, corporate loyalty rewards programs. Um, you've also mentioned the ticketing. Um, I'm wondering if we could just take a step back and you're talking to like a beginner. Um, I'll put myself out there. As someone sure. who's never bought trading cards, art, and is not much of a collector, how would you explain the value of an NFT to somebody like that? Great. Okay, so first, we should we should think a little bit about the design paradigm that goes on in Web3. So it's a different model of the way you interface on the internet. And the, the sort of the, the central object is what, what's often called a digital wallet. It's a core identity. It's an account for you that you control, like you have unique control over your wallet. And, it's, and you can bring from plat sort of across platforms. So like you go to a website, you connect your wallet. It's actually a little bit like login with Google or something of the sort, right? Like when you, when you connect login with Google, it like, you know, transfers a bunch of your profile information. The website can maybe see your profile picture and like, you know, you know, imports your email address and maybe your phone number or something of the sort. This is that, but it's like, you know, your own private repository that holds all of your digital assets and you can use it flexibly sort of anywhere. You connect, you know, to an, you know, connect to a given application, you connect your wallet, and the wallet reads all the assets in that identity and can, and can respond to them. And so, first of all, that means you can have an identity that's fundamentally cross-platform. So like in your social media experience, you might have a LinkedIn and a Twitter, um, you know, and maybe an Instagram, and you spend a lot of time uploading like the same content to both, but even more, you might have like a follow graph on one that's really hard to transport to another. Right. Like, and, and, and you just want to like get your friends, like sort of bring your Instagram friends also to your Twitter feed or whatever. And that's really, really hard in a web three world. That's automatic because your follow graph is part of your core digital identity. And like all the platforms like, that you connect to read parts of it or, or read whatever part you share with them. And so now you can build up, like if you're a content creator, you can build up an audience and you know, take that audience with you from platform to platform. And even more crucially, you can sort of like cross integrate your ex the experience on many different platforms, right? Your, your YouTube content and your Twitter content can like coexist and you sort of co-create you know, a, a more valuable like sort of product for everyone. The other thing, maybe one other simple example that we often give is what we call multi-threaded subscriptions. So if you, um, you know, maybe, you know, you, you really want to read all the news about your local sports team. And so because of that, you subscribe to the local newspaper because they cover like your, your sports team, of course. But a critical problem here is that half the team games are, you know, away. And that means that there is like a lot of really good content about them in other local newspapers and it's other local newspapers like every year. You can't just like subscribe to one other city's news because your team's playing all across the country, maybe the world. You could imagine an NFT that represents, it's like, you know, maybe you can get it from the team. It doesn't come from one of the newspapers. It's a, it's a unified subscription to all news about your team. And it lives in your digital wallet. And when you get up in the morning, you just like go to whatever like news site, you know, has, you know, wherever they played, you go to that news site, you collect your, connect your wallet. It sees that you have this all access subscription to the team, you know, unlocks the articles, lets you through the paywall. And then meanwhile, the team subsidizes. 
And so it like enables these new economies with third party value creation in a and, way that and was very And if I can back it up even further than that, I mean, for a lot of people, they might be saying, you know, what is an NFT in the first place? In the which case, I, one of the things that I even go to, <clears> and I know we kind of talked about the establishment <throat> of digital property rights, but one of our mutual friends uh, goes by the name of Adam Hollander, who we, he has this thing we call the Hollander Explanation, which is, you know, imagine you go into a museum and you see a beautiful painting on the wall. You can take a picture of that painting, but that picture is not worth really anything, right? It's just in your phone. Uh, you can buy a print in the gift shop of that painting, but it's also not worth much more than the paper it's printed on. The reason why the one on the wall is worth so much money is because the museum owns it. It's the original, and they can prove both of those things. And it's a simple way to explain that that digital ownership then leads to that flexibility that Scott was mentioning, where, you know, again, using a very practical example for a company, especially if someone's building against it, you know, let's say you have a certain video game skin and it's an NFT. Instead of living in that walled garden, you have a Fortnite skin. I used to work with Hot Pockets at Nestle. They sponsored NRG, which is a gaming team. To nobody's surprise, gamers overlap well with Hot Pocket eaters. That is who they're trying to market to, right? But it's a very broad appeal, right, going. And not that they wouldn't still do that. They certainly would. But you could also say everybody who owns a certain Fortnite skin can connect their digital wallet that Scott was talking about. And, you know, just basically by connecting that wallet, get a 25% discount off their new product. Now, suddenly you have a very precise idea that this is absolutely our target market. We are absolutely getting in there. And it's a win for both the gamer and sometimes the gamer, if they're younger, a win for the, the, the parent who's doing it too, saying, my kid's helping me save on my groceries. The kid is getting the Hot Pockets. And now suddenly you have someone in your ecosystem who otherwise might not be and you can target your fans. I mean, right now, you know, Drake or Mr. Beast, they don't know who their top fans are. NFTs allow you to precisely see that as a company. Um, and then to even expand a little bit further on kind of the question, I mean, you know, we use the term NFTs a lot. It very well is probably going to be like MP3s, right? MP3s in the early 2000s, everyone talked about MP3s and whatever, but no one says MP3s, it's just music. No one says QR code. No one says, let me go to the baseball game and I grab QR, my QR code, you grab your ticket. NFTs will very likely be the thing or the program that enables it. And I think for most people, for consumers, they're not going to know that they're interacting with NFTs or the blockchain. It's just going to work. Just as we don't care if something's on a certain type of yeah. cloud service, if it works, we care that it works. So it will be the software that flexibly powers those things, um, I think. And it's going to power, sorry, if I can cut back in for one more second, it's going to power a different type of brand experience, right? So. NFTs, again, because they're, they're these cross-platform, we say interoperable, they can interoperate across many different platforms. They're these cross-platform assets. And, and the ones on at public blockchains, at least, are also publicly visible. They, in effect, take everyone who owns the product and unify them into a network, right? It sort of, it takes all of the you know, sort of people in a brand, it's sort of like all of a brand's enthusiasts and turns them into a network that can together build the brand in value and is to some degree directly incentivized to do so because they're owners, right? And if you think about it, this is something brands have been trying to do forever, right? Like if you're, you know, if you're a, a clothing company, you would love to have an ongoing interaction with your customer in their experience of like owning their clothing and like wearing it around and like sort of like wearing it to, you know, to major sporting events or like to the, to the theater or whatever. But like, you can't do that as a clothing company because like you you have no direct connection to the customer once they own the asset and similar once they purchase the asset or you know you maybe work really hard at it you have an email list and you have to get them to show up or like you know you have a, a you know an instagram feed and you want them to post but it's really hard and moreover someone who's a fan you know as steve says like if you have like a if you're a big fortnite player you might there's like a lot of other stuff you might be a fan of but it's hard for and you might have friends or you be friends with people who are also fans but it's hard to find them the NFT overlays a network onto all of those consumer experiences and means that you can sort of be in bi-directional ongoing communication with the brand and find a, and form a community around the brand, sort of like unifying all of the enthusiasts. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It starts to raise a question, um, given how much opportunity there is like for it to be used. It raises a question to me about like the value and how do you find the value of an NFT, like as a use uh, or the actual price of it. So what elements or factors do you think influence the price of an NFT? This is this is one of those interesting ones where, to me, um, it, it's funny. I actually go back to, because there are certainly NFTs that have the speculative values that go up. And as any early market, you see this happening, right? We saw it with the early dot-com boom. We see it, you know, throughout 
tech markets or markets where there's financial incentives. That said, to me, I would actually take a different lens on that and say, what is the value to the individual user as it relates to the business? So for example, um, if I don't wear Nike shoes, it doesn't make sense for me to go spend a bunch of money on Nike NFTs because the utility associated with them and what Nike is going to program against them is going to be related to Nike shoes. Now I do wear Nike shoes, so I do own Nike NFTs, but you know, similarly, like, you know, and I own Adidas NFTs cause I do all the same there too. But you know, if there's brands that I don't interact with, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people related to the Starbucks work I do, which is, you know, people will be like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really drink coffee, but you know, I'm interested in these Starbucks NFTs. It's like, well, if you don't drink coffee or engage with Starbucks, then you know, a loyalty program, sure you could sign up and you could participate, but you're not going to get the maximum value out of it. Um, so to me, I tend to look at it a little bit different where, yes, there are things that can certainly affect the price of NFTs that can go up and down. But I, I think what interests us more than that, or at least me personally, I don't want to speak for Scott, is the brand building mm -hmm. dynamics that can, they can be used for, because I think they can fundamentally create these aligned incentive structures between consumers and businesses, and they can fundamentally change the way that we totally. interact with other fans of the brand. So you can sort of find your tribe everywhere. I mean, you think about like Jeep people, for example, people love their Jeeps, love their Jeeps, right? And so it's like, imagine if somebody who owns a Jeep in California can become someone who if we're friends with someone who owns a Jeep in, you know, uh, North Manteco, Minnesota, or, you know, Montgomery, Alabama, simply because they have an NFT that allows them to get access to a digital space. We have seen this with Starbucks, where people in California and Washington are great friends with people in Chicago and New York and LA and all these other places that they never would have met had not they owned this NFT and have the ability to connect. So not to completely dodge that question, but I think the interest we have is actually less in the financialization of it and more in the opportunity it presents uh, to create really robust brands and really robust utility for customers and brands alike. Totally agreed. Um, and I should say, by the way, talking about people who would never have met without NFTs, Steve and I met, of course, entirely through NFT world, like in a live Twitter space for an NFT community we were both in. And we talk about this in the book. To this date, we've never actually met in person. We've spent thousands of hours, you know, sort of on calls together. We wrote a book together, like in a bunch of articles, and we have never actually met face to face. It's like a very like Web3, like internet enabled interaction. But yeah, so another thing we talk about is that like really, truly, we think that the ubiquity of NFTs is going to come from lots of these like little micro applications that are very broad mass market, right? It's like, it's digital tickets, it's coffee rewards, it's, you know, souvenir stamps when you visit a national park. Like lots of these things, you know, are going to be sold in massive quantities for like, you know, a dollar or as freebies when you do a thing, just as like, you know, sort of a, a reward for coming, right? You went to the national park, you like, you know, sort of took some, you know, sort of took some photos and you collected your stamp, just like we have like, you know, sort of stamp passports for national parks today. Um, so we think the opportunity is mostly around sort of these like broadly accessible sort of consumer facing NFT products, by the way, not even just collectibles or, or tradable items, but also identity records of various forms, right? Like credentials from online courses, maybe even one day, like, you know, with the proper privacy guardrails in place, your health data, making it much easier to like move your dental records from one provider to another than it is today, where you have to like call someone, like do a bunch of authorizations, get the thing faxed, then fax it to somebody else who even has a fax machine today. Like, you know, this could all just be completely seamless through your digital wallet. And so price is just going to be like ordinary goods, right? It's going to be prices determined by the value to the consumer. And then the total value that they can you know, sort of that these types of consumer experiences can create is going to be much greater than and, digital. And one last, last thing I, I just want to build on that from a community building perspective, because Scott brought it up really well, is that I think our story, you know, people hear our story that we've never met in person. We wrote a book together. We wrote articles together and they say, wow, that's crazy. I think our type of story will be entirely more common in the next seven to 10 years as this continues to grow from a brand building perspective, because, you know, people can do that. And the opportunity to connect in those digital spaces, I mean, before uh, I got into Web3, even before COVID, it was rare that I would see and hang out with friends quite as often. But now that I have access to these digital spaces based on what I own, where my interests are, I have more yeah. friends and more discussions and feel more socially connected than ever before in my Absolutely. life. And I think it's something that the human uh, sort of humans are craving more because they're so busy as it is. We're spending more time online in digital spaces. And so I think being able to connect in digital spaces with people who have the same passion, whether you're an Ohio State Buckeye fan or whether you are somebody who is passionate about, you know, your motor Harley Davidson motorcycle, 
the chance to really connect in those niche communities, I think is going to expand like crazy. Totally. Yeah. The, um, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I can think about how a lot of those traditional communities you mentioned, like the Jeep community or your college community would bond. What, what are, one of my questions, yeah. what, what are some of the most creative kind of, uh, communities or maybe corporate partnerships you've seen that have helped, um, uh, build a community? I mean, we've mentioned Starbucks and Nike off the bat. I yeah. do want to give credit to Adidas because I think they came in really smart early on where in order to, you know, introduce some new uh, merchandise in a gated drop, which by the way, very logical business case for them, right? If Adidas drops merchandise and it can sometimes get botted, well, why not have a gated drop for your true fans to be able to get access to buy without any sort of pressure or, 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 or issues? And, you know, they partnered with, a couple of the uh, Board Ape Yacht Club, which is one of the really popular uh, clubs uh, run by Yuga Labs, a uh, startup that got $450 million uh, in funding as a unicorn startup. Uh, they partnered with Pixel Vault, which is a uh, sort of decentral turn is sort of a decentralized gaming network now that they work on. And they were really smart in that partnership because it meant that everything would work. They didn't come in and just try to do things in an inauthentic way. They were able to engage with the community, a couple of communities that worked really well. And they were able to then uh, ultimately gate their drop and ensure that their tech worked really well. So I like that one as well. But um, th th that one comes to mind for me as well as, again, Nike and Starbucks, I think, are, are crushing it. So um, first of all, agreed on all of those. Um, I think also important to emphasize, you mentioned Board Ape Yacht Club, Steve. There are a number of digitally native brands um, that have built off of NFTs as a springboard into like broader and more complex brand activations and even physical products. Like there's this company, Pudgy Penguins, for example, that started with NFTs to build an initial community of enthusiasts and many others have actually done this too, like Kataro Studios, like others. Um, and then now are selling physical products in the world that also come with NFTs attached. And so, you know, their initial fan base around the, the NFTs then you know, sort of creates a springboard with which to build a fan base around the physical assets, which then brings more people into the NFT space. I also think there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on with transmedia. Like, um, for example, there's a, a, you know, a media studio called Forgotten Runes that created a series of NFT characters, sort of think like your Dungeons and Dragons type wizards and stuff. And then people created in the community, created stories around their wizards and, and history and, and structure for them which then the brand integrated a lot of those into a comic series and a video, like a couple of video games. And, and there's this, you know, Steve and I call it in the book, a semi-permeable membrane between the canon and the fandom. And you can see that, you know, imagine that for lots of other like media properties, think like, you know, sort of the Star Wars is of the world. Um, and then, you know, I guess like the other thing to really call out is that we're starting, we're seeing more and more emerging applications, right? Like, and, it's almost impossible to guess right now what will be like the most exciting NFTs in five years, you know, but, but because con conceptually it's a new technology, right? It's like the early days of the internet all over again. But like, for example, right now, something people are thinking really hard about is, you know, using NFTs to do cross-platform identity records for people that prove they are who they say they are, right? In a world that's becoming more concerned about AI fakes, now having a digital signature that proves you are who you say you are, right? You go to like a, you know, a, a human, you present ID, you get authenticated, but then you get a digital asset that you control that you can use to sign things as this is me. I think that type of application is going to be, you know, very relevant, very soon. That's, um, yeah, I mean, you beat me to my next question because that, that's actually what I was thinking of. You've mentioned so many like <laughs> limitless uh, kind of opportunities um, to get involved in the space, but um if I could ask each of you, maybe just a one one more trend that you think w is likely to stick around um, with NFTs. Ooh, okay. I think uh, what's called RWAs or real world assets is one that I'm paying very close attention to. So, uh, if you have a Pokemon card, right, a Charizard card, or a Babe Ruth card, as examples of, of things, or even you know, my my dad was a baseball collector, so those come to mind to me. Like he had Yankee Stadium seats and all these things. Right now, you can get certificates of authenticity, which you then put in like, what, like maybe a fireproof box under your bed and you hope that it's safe and maybe you can find it, maybe you can't. Like as we were looking through his stuff, some of them were in the back of the, you know, a photo. some of them were in the back of the frame. Some of them were, you know, in a drawer somewhere. So the idea that you can authenticate on the actual blockchain, uh, a item that is a real world asset 
And let's say that you don't even want to have it, right? I mean, there are people who buy art and vault it as an investment, right? If somebody wanted to do that, you could you could say, let's say have a Jackie Robinson card and have it vaulted through it breaks, right? There are companies working on this. And then have an exact digital representation of it, which is, you know, and, and people say like, oh, well, the physical one, don't you want the physical one? Well, my kids, you know, as they age into the consumer ages, they don't care as much about physical items. In fact, my daughter bought a Roblox plushie strictly to get the digital item so that she could flex it online in digital spaces. And nobody sees the physical fl fl uh, plushie. So the idea that you would get a real world asset like a baseball card, you'd be able to authenticate it and actually buy and sell and trade it while it's sitting in a vault, you know, by a large company, uh, a major security company means you're not at security risk of it being at your house. You don't have to worry about losing it in a fire. You can represent it throughout your digital spaces. And at the same time, you could buy it and sell it. And you could have it where, let's say, the original person who owned it sold it to you. They could program in a royalty each time it's sold. So there's a lot of applications for that. But you can think about how that can work uh, for a variety of things. But I think real-world assets and pinning an actual one to them. And the other thing you could do with real-world assets as, a, as an aside is, you know, if I have a real world asset, you could actually have an NFC chip in it, a non-frequency communication chip. There's a company called IYK doing this where you tap it and then that item goes to your wallet and I've handed it to you. You tap it, that item goes to your wallet. So whoever has the physical control of the item can then take the digital control and that creates the opportunity to buy, sell and authenticate all in one. And footnote on that, on that IYK application, you can imagine, for example, that a book would have an ebook audio book twin. So it's like, uh, you know, you buy the physical book, you tap the book, and now you have an asset that gives you access to a copy of the ebook. And if you give the book to someone else, they can claim that ebook away from you. It sort of like travels with the book. Um, but so I'm going to maybe like, you know, Kobayashi Maru your question and say that I think the trend that we're going to see is, you know, each of these NFT applications has the potential to sort of like turn into an expansive brand through, you know, sort of a, what we call the NFT staircase, right? It starts with ownership of an NFT, like a digital asset is sort of a foundation. You build on top of it, utility, various forms of functional, you know, benefit for, for holding it, including by the way, not just the creator, but like third parties can build utility as well, right? If, you know, if you're Hot Pockets, you can give utility to a Fortnite skin NFT. And then from there, people integrate the NFTs into their digital identity and their personal identity too, eventually, and form community. And that community drives the brand forward. And, you know, so we're going to start seeing assets like sports tickets turning into NFTs. And those are going to turn into brand anchors for these like close knit community experiences sort of automatically, right? Like when you have a physical ticket, you know, when you have a QR code in your email after the game, it vanishes. When you have a physical ticket, you could put it on your wall or your shelf as a memento, but it doesn't do anything anymore. When you have an NF ticket, now suddenly it becomes the beginning of an entire like ongoing relationship with the brand and with other fans. And we're gonna see that like turning, you know, happening with every category of digital asset. You, you've both given us so much to think about. Um, I, I really wanna thank you for your time, um, Steve and Scott for joining us. Um, Steve, your book is back there. If people can see it, um, we'll also have a link on YouTube as well. It's called The Everything Token. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the everything token, how NFTs and Web3 will transform <laughs> the way we buy, sell, and create. So thank you to Stephen Scott for joining us at Talks at Google. Mm -hmm.